ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فضا غنيظ القلب لم فضوا من حولك فاعف عنهم واستغفر لهم وشاورهم في الأم فإذا عزمت فتوكل على الله إن الله يحب المتوكلين رب الشحي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين The ayah I want to share with you in today's khutbah is very difficult It's easy to talk about it in the context of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the ayah is primarily about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam But it's very difficult to talk about it in the sense of the sunnah of the Messenger والسلام, and the example that he left for us to follow. Oftentimes it's easy to talk about how great the Prophet was والسلام, and what an incredible example it was. But it's very difficult to put a mirror to ourselves and discover how far we are from the example he left. Because Allah did not make him an incredible example just for us to praise his example. He made him that example so we can live up as best we can to that example. So in this particular ayah, Allah Azza wa highlights a quality of leadership. And the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that he played many roles. He played the role of a father, a husband, a friend, a neighbor. He played many roles. But in this particular ayah, Allah highlights his role as a leader. And one quality of leadership that Allah Azza wa highlights. And before I talk about it, I want uh, ourselves, myself included, to remember that when we learn something about the Messenger of Allah والسلام, we have to think about how does that affect me as a leader. And many of you sitting in the audience or one day listening to this recording are going to be saying, well I'm not a leader, so it doesn't apply to me. As a matter of fact, every member of this ummah, in some capacity we have all, all been given a position of leadership, all of us. And some of our leaderships are more obvious than others. Every one of the men here that has, has a life, has children, is the leader of their household. You're leading your household. And so when you learn something about the leadership of Rasulullah وسلم, and I learn something about that, I have to apply it to my family. Some of you are managers at the office. So you have to apply this to your employees because you're leaders over them. Some of you are teachers and you're leaders of your classroom. So you have to apply to that. Some of you are in leadership positions at organizations or at masajid or at schools. You know, and in any of those capacities, you are responsible over people, whether it's part-time or full-time, whether it's a little bit or a lot, it doesn't matter. But in pretty much every institution that human beings belong to, there's a hierarchy and there's leadership. And in many of those cases, you happen to be in a position of leadership. It may not be absolute leadership, it may be limited, but still it is there. So we have to keep that, bear in mind that recognition that it's really not just talking about Rasulullah وسلم, but through his legacy it's talking to all of us and ta'ala we can benefit something from these, these beautiful ayat and this actually one particularly beautiful ayat. Allah Azza wa revealed this ayat in the context of the battle of Uhud. And Uhud in, uh, in Surah Ali Imran Allah talks about it extensively. But you know 60 or so ayat are dedicated to the, the discussion about what went wrong at Uhud. And this is after the effect, after the fact. In other words, Allah did not reveal these ayat before the battle, but rather these ayat came down after the battle. And we, many of you are familiar, some of you need a reminder, the battle of Badr was incredible success. And in the battle of Badr, we were, the, the Muslims were able to fight against the massive army, much more prepared, much more outnumbering army of Quraysh, and still, you know, annihilate 70 of their leaders. But the battle of Uhud was the exact opposite. It started out just like Badr. We were winning in the beginning. And then towards, because of one strategic mistake, and that of the archers that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed, on the mountain he appointed, you can call them snipers today, but they were archers back then, right? 
He appointed them to stay in their place and he told them, even if you see birds eating from our corpses, in other words, every one of us is dead, don't you move from there. Don't move from there, you know. And they saw the opposite. They didn't see the Muslims dying and birds eating off of their corpses. They saw the exact opposite. They saw that the Muslims were actually destroying the enemy. Allah Himself says, Allah fulfilled His promise to you when you were making the enemy feel the heat of battle. You were annihilating the enemy, you were wiping them out, you were driving them away. The enemy was making a run for it in the battle of Uhud. That's Allah's own description. That's the time where there was a disagreement among them and some of them decided, no, 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 the Prophet said والسلام, don't come down until, even if you see us dying. But this is the opposite case, we're actually winning, so it's okay. That's not what he meant. So there was a disagreement among them, and by the way, that's a separate topic. How do you deal with disagreements? That's not my topic today. How do you deal with disagreements? And actually, if you legitimately look at it, the disagreement among those Sahaba was a legitimate difference of opinion. And actually it was not that some decided to disobey the Messenger and the other did not. That's not the case. They actually both looked at the same statement of the Prophet ﷺ and interpreted in two different ways. They had two different ways of looking at the same thing. And this happens on multiple occasions among the Sahaba. The problem wasn't that they interpreted it differently. The problem was they broke the chain of command. Because the, the one in charge, the Sahabi left in charge, the battalion commander, his decision was we stay. And when the Prophet ﷺ leaves somebody in charge, you have to listen to him even if you have a difference of opinion. That was the real problem. But that's a separate topic. In any case, they come down. <laughs> Khalid ibn Walid, who we say now, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, if we were alive then at that time, we would not be saying radiallahu ta'ala anhu, because he wasn't Muslim yet. And he was an experienced military man, so he sees from the corner of his eye that the Muslims have left their strategic sniper post. So he rendezvous, he comes around and flanks the Muslims from behind, and the entire scene of battle turns upside down. All chaos breaks, all hell breaks loose. You know, the Muslims don't know where the enemy is coming from, what's going on, even the Messenger ﷺ got hit so hard, he fell unconscious. His, his tooth fell out and he fell unconscious. And then when he woke up, his face was filled with blood. And while he was passed out, a rumor spread that the Prophet's been killed. Alayhi salatu wasalam. You know? And then Allah Azza wa revealed the ayah, وَمَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍ أَن تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ It was not appropriate for a No Prophet gets to die until Allah gives permission. Except that Allah gives permission. Anyway, this happens and the, there's so much chaos on the battlefield that people like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you can imagine how big an asset. Umar is in the battlefield radiallahu anhu, he drops his sword and sits on the ground, he goes, what's the point now? He got killed, what's the point now? And Muslims were demoralized, then it was you know, retrieved that the Prophet was actually still alive. And so the Muslims went into a retreat position, and they headed up towards the mountain. إِذْ تُصْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْعُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ Allah describes when you were running up the mountain, you were scaling the mountain, and you wouldn't turn back to look at anyone. In other words, you were desperate to save the Messenger والسلام, from this chaos situation. Now, and, and by the way, some people were running ahead and they left the Prophet behind. وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ And the Messenger is calling you from behind you. And then Allah Azza wa gave them the courage to fight back and then they, they turned a little bit of it around. But still, by the time it was over, 70 of the greatest Sahaba of the Ummah were Shaheed. They had been killed, including the beloved uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who many of you know the story. When Hind got a hold of him, she actually you know, uh, ripped his heart out and chewed on it. <coughs> and so for the Prophet to see his uncle in that state وسلم, after him almost being killed himself, is a traumatic experience. And all of these problems began with what? With one act of disobedience. One act of disobedience and 70 Sahaba are killed, including the family of the Prophet وسلم. Now you tell me, actually don't tell me out loud because this is a khumbah, but I want you to think about this. The real test of leadership is not when your followers are following you. The real test of leadership is when your followers disappoint you. When you have all the reasons in the world to be angry at them. Because they've done something terrible. They did not obey a very simple instruction. They have made a mistake. And you can imagine now, after it's all said and done, those archers, those sahaba who were positioned in those sniper positions, when they are going to be having a meeting with Rasulullah وسلم, they are expecting terrible things. They have disappointed their beloved وسلم. I mean, they must be scared for their life, you know? 
And so before the meeting, and you can imagine, by the way, let's just put this in perspective a little bit. You mess up at your job. You had a project due, the client was waiting for it, you didn't submit the project. You sent the email, but you didn't go through, and you, saw, you thought that it went through. And now you're in big trouble because the client is asking for canceling the contract and all this stuff, and your company is going to lose a million bucks, and it's your fault because you didn't send the email. And on Monday, this is Friday, so the whole weekend's gone by, and on Monday there's going to be a meeting with your boss. What are you expecting in the meeting, huh? <laughs> and that's just about money. This is about lives. This is about family loss. This is about blood. This is about that. Can you imagine what that meaning has to be like? It's a problem love. And so when that happens, when Allah is, I don't need it, that's fine. Okay. So when that happens, when this meeting is about to happen, Allah reveals an ayah to the Prophet wasallam before he goes to meet with the Sahaba. So this is Allah preparing him for this meeting. That's the ayah. How does a leader deal with people that have terribly, terribly disappointed? The ayah begins, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَنَا It is by the unimaginable, indescribable, mysterious, loving mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. The language here deserves a lot of attention. The fact that it began with what we call a job, which is بِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ Actually, لِنْتَنَا هُمْ بِرَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ That's the normal Arabic sentence structure. For this sentence, but when you do this taqdeem, when you put this in the beginning, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ When you do it like that, that actually means this is an unusual kind of rahmah. And it is only because of this special gift from Allah of rahmah, of loving mercy, that has come from Him to you, that you are going to be able to be nice to them and lenient towards them in the meeting. The second benefit here that I want to highlight is the word ma. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ فَالنَّحْوِي يَقُولَ أَنَّ هَذِي مَا إِضَافِيَةٍ The ma is extra actually. You can say فَبِي رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ So the addition of the ma actually adds a kind of ta'ajjub, they say in Malaka. In other words, in simple English, it is a shocking level of mercy. It is a shocking level of love and compassion that has come from Allah. Then the fact that rahmah is also not بِي رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ you know, in other places in Quran, Allah says, "Qul bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi." There's an ibafa; they're connected together. But here He says, "Fa bi ma rahmatin min Allah." It separated the two with a min, and the benefit of separating these two it creates a mystery. What kind of love and mercy is this? Where did it come from? And then it answers the question, "Min Allah." To say there are three or four or five devices just in فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ that are Im almost impossible to capture in the English translation. But the point of them is, the way that Allah has granted the gift of rahmah, of leniency, of softness, of love to the Messenger of Allah, and the gift that He gave to the Sahaba also, is beyond description. Because no leader <laughs> could ever leave an example like this one. When in the military, soldiers make a mistake, lives are lost. And when there's a hearing afterwards, it's called a court-martial. And when that hearing is done, typically those soldiers are either executed or sent into prison. That's what, what happens to them, because of insubordination. Because they disobeyed a direct order. That's what happens in a usual military scenario. And by the way, this is directly a military scenario. And the Rasul in this case is not just a leader, he's a general of the army. And these soldiers are presenting their case. And Allah says, you are exceptional, there's no one like you. Even in this case, you are unusually lenient. Heaven, it's, it's something that's come from Allah for you. And then he says, now the word linta, it fascinates me, the, the, the words in this ayah, linta lahum, which I keep translating, you are lenient towards them. The word lana in Arabic, duddul khushuda, it's the opposite of ruggedness and harshness. And harshness could be in your look, Harshness could be in your speech, harshness could be in your actions, harshness could be in your gestures, harshness can also be in your silence. Sometimes you're mad at your son or your daughter, and your harshness is not that you yelled at them, but your harshness is that you're not talking to them, that you're not making eye contact. Sometimes the mother is upset with the child, and the mother doesn't look at the baby, and the baby knows, the child knows, mama's angry. She doesn't have to say anything, but there is a kind of khushuna there, a ruggedness, a roughness there, because of her attitude, her facial expression. Allah Azza wa Jalla told the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Lintalahum lisanan, lintalahum 
Nazaran? Did he specify how are you lenient towards them? He left it completely open. In other words, in your speech, in your facial expressions, in your emotions, in your interaction with them, the way you will look towards them, all of it will have to be soft. That is specially from Allah. Before you go into this meeting, let me prepare you. SubhanAllah. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ بِنْتَهَا This, just a little bit more about the word lean. Where this word comes from. They say in Arabic, تَلَيَّنَا they say in Arabic, when you give somebody compliments to make them feel good, تَلَيَّنَا يعني وَصَفَهُ بِخَيْرِ أَوْصَافِهِ When you describe someone with the best qualities that they have, they describe this as تَلَيَّنَا لِنْتَلَهُمْ One of the implications is when you go in there, highlight the good in these people. The meaning is supposed to be not about what is good about them. The meaning is supposed to be what they messed up with. What is bad about them. But when you go, Say good things about them. They're depressed enough as it is. They're embarrassed enough as, as it is about what happened. They're human beings, they made a mistake. They came to believe in you and they've made sacrifices for you before, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They've made sacrifices for you before. And yes, they made a mistake, but it doesn't wipe away all of the good that they have. And they need a little bit of a morale boost and something they were not expecting from you. So you need to go in there and say something nice to each of them. Lintana. You're going to start this meeting by a compliment. This is incredible leadership. You know, they, have, they pay millions of dollars, executives pay millions of dollars, and companies spend all this money on executive leadership and corporate leadership and boosting the morale. And some of you go to those boring meetings, and you look at 800 PowerPoint presentation slides, and you fall asleep, and at the end of it, yeah, we're going to beat the last year's sales record. Yes! Everybody's in it only for the money. That's, not, that's all artificial. At the end of the day, all of it is artificial. That's not real leadership. That's not real leadership. The real leadership, the, the prophetic model of leadership, the model of Muhammad Rasulullah is really a nasu abidul ihsan. People are in servitude. They have become enslaved to those who are good to them. And when you were least expecting that you would be good to your followers, that's when you were good to them. Lin Going further, the word lain also, I'm still not done with this word, because this word just, it really baffles me. Allah Azza wa Jal uses this word and its meanings in Arabic just, you know, sahaha bilayani. He listened to her, he listened to the woman, softening his stance. In other words, layan is used when you listen to someone without passing judgment. You listen to someone after putting your anger aside. You know, there's one thing when you're about to listen to someone. I give you an example so it's easy to understand. If my daughter got an F in math, and I said, what happened here? Explain yourself. I don't care what she says, I'll still be angry. Let's be honest. It's not like she's going to give me a very logical explanation. I'll say, oh, okay, mashallah, give me a hug. It's not going to be like that. I have already made up my mind that I am upset. That decision's already been made. Now, no matter what she says, it really doesn't matter. But sahahu bilayani, he means actually he listened to her with full attention, the expression they use in Arabic. But he didn't pre make up his mind that he's going to be angry anyway. Look, you made a mistake. The bottom line is I don't care how you slice it, you messed up. But no, you're going to listen to them softly too. Not only will you give them softness, but when they're speaking, you're not going to be angry. You're going to listen calmly. And you're going to maintain a soft sense towards them. You know the word lean actually in Arabic also means a soft date that's particularly tasty. You know? You should be like that date. You should be a treat to them when you go in there. SubhanAllah. Then the word means rakha, softness, na'im. It means something that gives you comfort. You should go in there and be a source of comfort for these people. You should be a source of comfort, not a source of misery, not a source of sadness, not a source of depression. You should be the other way around. This is about the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so far. But you know what? This is also about us. We're leaders too, aren't we? When the wife disappoints you, when the child disappoints you, when the employee disappoints you, when the friend disappoints you, what's our reaction? How do we respond? How do we deal with it? And by the way, the Rasulullah Wasallam is being told to calm down and be the nicest he can be in a situation where loved ones have been killed. But we lose our temper over keys that are lost, over a cell phone you can't find, you know, over a phone call that she didn't pick up, over that. Can you imagine how far? Then we say we love the Sunnah of the Prophet <laughs> What position are we in? to talk like that. 
This is the legacy he left, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is the leadership Allah is teaching him. You know, thank Allah, we're not put in that position. We're not put in that position, because that's a real leader to handle that kind of a situation. This is linta lahum. Walau kunta fadlan, and the ayat go on. Uh, remarkable words. Walau kunta fadlan. Fadl, actually, they say in Arabic, means a few things. I'll highlight each of them. First of them, it means khashnul kalam. Someone who speaks in a harsh, mean, nasty way. Fadl literally has to do with speaking to somebody. And actually, afbaltuhu actually means I sprayed him or I put, poured dust on someone. In other words, you know when somebody's yelling at the top of their lungs and there's almost spit coming out of their mouth? This is fadl. This is fadl in Arabic. Like you literally sprayed them with your yelling and screaming. If you were screaming at the top of your lungs and you were yelling and scolding at them, if you walked into that meeting and said, what happened? What did you people do? If you did that, that's what Allah is saying. Had you been that way, walau kunta fadlan. And this is about the speech. But you know what? Sometimes there are people who, have, who say, well, I, am, I say mean things, but I still love you inside. I mean, I, I yell at you, and I yell at you at the top of my lungs, but give me a hug afterwards. Some parents do that. Some parents lose their cool. They go crazy. They go honk on their kids. And then afterwards, they're like, hey, I still love you. It's okay. You want to get some ice cream? You know what? It doesn't undo it. The damage is done. Allah Azza wa Jal, before He talked about you shouldn't be hard in your heart. That came second. You need to watch your tongue first. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْلًا First. غَلِيب الْقَلْبِ Second. غَلِيب الْقَلْبِ means hard of the heart. In other words, inside you developed a grudge against them. You can't have that either. So there are two problems. One, speaking in an angry way. Even though, I, I love you, but you messed up. No, 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 no. You can't do that either. You can't do that either. First of all, you gotta speak very softly. And second of all, even when you sometimes people speak softly and the opposite happens. They're speaking softly, but they're holding a grudge inside. The mother is saying, the father is saying, the husband is saying, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. But he's angry. He's got something inside. He's like, yeah, I hate when you do this. I'm not gonna say anything, but oh, man, I'm burning inside. Allah adds the second problem, ghali al qalb. in Arabic is something impenetrable. Something which you cannot penetrate. If your heart becomes so hard that you are so disappointed with these people that you have written them off, even if you're speaking nicely to them, you've basically written them off. They, you've given up on them. They are no good to you. This is the qalb. If that, if you were that way, so there are two things here about the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One, when you go in there, be nice. Your face shouldn't look depressed. You should make them feel comfortable. Say good things about them. Calm them down. When they speak, listen softly. You need to be able to control all of your emotions and all of that sadness and put it away when you deal with your followers. And on the other hand, if you didn't do these things, and if you were like any other leader who would lose their cool, what would happen? لَن فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ بِلَامِ التَّوْكِيدِ لَن فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ Some ulama about Islam, they say, تُشِيرُوا إِلَى الْقَسَمِ الْمَحْضُوفِ they say Allah swears here. Allah swears to the fact that the Sahaba would have run away from you. They would have run. This is in the Quran, guys. This is in the Quran. Sahaba would have run away from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah swears by it if he was mean. If he was mean, the messenger would still be speaking the truth. He would still be the recipient of the Quran. He would still be saying La ilaha illallah. He would still be teaching everything. All of the evidences would still be there. But one thing would be missing. His softness. And Allah says even that much is enough for these sahaba who are willing to die for you. They're dying for the sake of Allah Azza wa Even they, Allah guarantees it, they would have run away from you. And what is infidad? Infidad, لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Infidad in Arabic means when you drop a cup or a glass and it shatters. And all the pieces of glass run away from each other. You know what? Why that's described? Not la farhu min hawlik, they would have run away from you. You know? La abaku min hawlik, they would have escaped from you. No, no, no. Len fadlu min hawlik. Why they bought? Because when a glass breaks, you can't put it back together. They will run away from you in a way, they will never come back. And even if they do, it will never be like the unity that they once had. This is the lesson of leadership taught to Rasulullah. Len fadlu min hawlik. They would have, you cannot afford to be like this to them. 
We are very good at getting angry. Muslims, mashallah. We're very good at getting angry. Everything makes us angry. Everything makes us angry. You know what really should make us angry? Is that how far we are from the legacy that the Prophet left. How far we are from the word of Allah. How bad we are at controlling our temper. That should make us mad at ourselves, not anybody else. What do you do after that? The ayah is not done. I know I have a couple of minutes left, so i got to speed this up. But, you know, as, as this, this kalam, this speech, this, this orientation, leadership training from Allah to Rasulullah Kampuz, what does he tell him? He tells him, فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ Then you know what you do when you go and be nice and all of that, but you need to pardon them and move on. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ Lovingly pardon them. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ And make istighfar for them, ask Allah to forgive them. There's nothing between you and me, we're good. I'm no longer angry. I'm already being nice to you and I'm no longer angry. That's number one. Number two, when the meeting is over and you're going to go make dua, and you're going to make, make dua for the maghfirah of Hamza ta'ala, you're going to make dua for the entrance into Jannah of all of those shuhada, you will also make dua for the archers who started this mess. You will make dua for them. This will be your true test of leadership. How you know that you have nothing left in your heart, that when you're making dua for your parents, when you're making dua for your loved ones, you can make dua for those who disappointed you, those who messed up. That's a leader. And by the way, this dua is not in public. You don't walk into the meeting and start the meeting by saying, May Allah forgive you people. No, 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 no. This is in private. Because making dua in public is a spectacle. You're just embarrassing people. This is your way of blaming them. You know? But in private, when you're begging to Allah in your own time, then you made time to beg for them, the ones who disappointed you and said to Allah, Ya Rabb, these are just followers, they made a mistake. Forgive their mistake. Let them move on from this. Make them stronger, make us you know, better men. Don't put their hatred for them in other, the hearts of other Muslims. This is the dua you make. But it's not over yet. Then the next time there's a meeting, the next time there's a meeting, call the people who disappointed you. Have them join the meeting. And not only have them join the meeting, when an important decision comes up, you ask them, what do you think? I'd like to hear your opinion. And don't just listen to their opinion for an artificial, hey, tell me what you think, and whatever you say, Jazakallah khairan. No, 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 no. Actually consult their opinion. Washa'awirhum fil amr. Take their consultation in matters of decision. Take whose consultation? The same people who disappointed you. Imagine the same people who disappointed Rasulullah in the battle of Uhud. There's a meeting happening for Ahzab. He calls the same Sahaba and says, what do you think we should do? And they're like, what? what? Me? My, you want my opinion? I just messed up last time. No, no, no. I need your opinion. I value your opinion. And this Sahabi will say, this, is, this, is, this can only be the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because no man has that heart, a heart that big. This has to come from Allah. That's why the ayah began, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ Allah. We don't discard people's opinion because they disappointed us in the past. And we don't just, you know, artificially take their opinion. A lot of times we, we just listen to people, but we don't really listen to them. We just kind of don't go through the exercise. You know, it's just artificial. We can't, we shouldn't be doing that. The messenger, whatever he does, he does with sincerity. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَشَعْبِرُهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ then finally, when you make a decision, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then when you reach the final decision, then trust Allah. Because the decision you people reach, and that you reach Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is not a guarantee of success. The guarantee of success comes from Allah, so trust Allah after you make a decision. فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْفَتَوَكِّلِينَ No doubt Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. What are we learning at the end? We don't trust our leadership. And our leadership doesn't even trust itself. At the end of the day, all of us trust Allah Azza wa Jal. We do the best we can. We do the best we can. And whatever decisions we make, at the end of it, we don't say, I made the, I'm the leader, I made this decision, it's the best decision. No, we say, I made this decision, Ya Rab, put, put khair in it. Because of this decision, it doesn't just affect me, it affects all of my followers. It affects the whole family. It affects everything. So Ya Allah, put khair in this decision. I don't know if it's the best. They have relied upon me because they rely upon you. This is a beautiful, beautiful sampling of the Rasulullah's legacy of leadership. And I pray that we're able to even, if we can get an ounce of this into our personal lives, even a little bit of it into our family lives, into our business lives, into our professional lives, into our community life, then wallahi the barakat of the sunnah, 
the blessings of the sunnah. You know one of the beautiful blessings of the sunnah? When we really apply leadership, is people love each other for the sake of Allah. And you don't apply leadership principles, and people start hating each other. People start getting angry at each other. This kills anger. This puts out the fire. So may Allah Azza wa make us of the people who are able to have soft hearts towards their fellow Muslims and recognize the value and appreciation of forgiving one another and moving forward. يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتائه القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقل الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين